Hi, good evening, um, governors, distinguished guests and students to our annual Lincoln Lecture. The Lincoln Lecture offers the opportunity for students and guests of the college to hear a lecture by a figure of national or international prominence. As you'll see in your programme, previous speakers and topics have tended to all have a strong American and Lincoln-esque theme. This year we've chosen to move away from America um, and to focus on the fascinating culture and country that is China. Though Professor Sturtz has, I think, accepted the challenge to have a nod to Lincoln uh, somewhere during the course of the evening. Um, and I'm delighted that Professor Sturtz has accepted our invitation to join us here this evening. Professor Sturtz is the Joseph Needham Professor of Chinese at the University of Cambridge, is head of the East Asian Department of Cambridge, and also a fellow of Clare College. I first met Professor Sturks in the days when he was a mister and I was a newly qualified teacher. So I'm hoping all that you will stay very much to topic tonight. Um, <coughs> and politics will uh, last uh, in Cambridge 20 or so years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Sturks' academic career started in his native Belgium, has taken him to Taiwan, Cambridge, Oxford, Arizona, and back again to Cambridge. And his academic work combines language, history, anthropology, religion, and intriguingly, and more recently, food. This afternoon, Professor Sturtz met over 50 of our six formers and talked informally about China 2,000 years ago, modern China, some ideas about the future of China, and displayed a range of artifacts used in his academic work. And questions from our six formers broached politics, history, language, society, religion, and international relations, and provided a tantalizing taster for what I'm sure will be a thoroughly fascinating lecture this evening. So, can I please extend a very warm welcome to Professor Sturks as he explores the world according to Confucius in China and beyond. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jonathan. It's wonderful to be here. It's great to escape at the end of term from Cambridge and spend half a day here. Um, and it's wonderful to see uh, that you've had a stellar career all the way up to this wonderful college. And for the governors amongst you, I think you've made an excellent appointment. I paid him to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I thought for a while about how I would link Lincoln to the person I really want to talk about today, that is Confucius. Both of these figures had views about society that were quite bold, that were quite revolutionary. They are both figures who lived in totally different times and in different uh, parts of the world. <coughs> and I could not find an artifact, a piece of text, or anything else that would link the two until I stumbled on the artwork of this particular Chinese artist in California who did a representation of the head of Lincoln and one of Confucius and does it over several phases so that the face changes into three Chinese characters. Tian Xia He Tian Xia He which translates in English something like peace or harmony under heaven. In other words, this is the Chinese translation of an ideal that is branded around in China today quite a bit, namely the harmonious society, which is sometimes linked with a new theme the Chinese government uses, uses that is the China dream, which is unlike the American dream. It's a dream of a different kind. But what struck me is that this ideal of harmony as the ultimate aim of politics, which we deem to be very universal, is one that was developed in China at a very early stage, in the 6th and 5th centuries BC. And it had inspired a philosophy that we associate with one particular figure, whom you have here, namely Confucius. 
And what I'd like to do today is I would like to introduce you to this particular thinker, try to unpack some of his ideas, um, and try to show you how the Confucian view of the world is radically different you know, from our view of the world, but it is one that is part of the genetic code, of the way in which the Chinese increasingly are looking at the world again today, 2,000 years or 2,500 years later. Now here you have a statue, which actually is a statue that stands on the alley in the back gardens of my own college in Clare. And this is a statue that came to us via an artist, a very famous artist, who exhibited this statue outside the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge. Now one of the most politically, or one of the most difficult discussions one can have in any Cambridge college is when an artist gives a piece of work, whether or not A, it's being kept, B, whether or not it's going to be shown somewhere, and whether that should be in the public view, whether it is actually correct to have it in one part of the college or in the other part of the college, and whether or not people might take offense, whether a specific thinker, philosopher, or writer gets a platform for public viewing. Now, I managed to get the governing body of my college to accept this statue. And while it has traveled across the college, it has now found a fixed place. And it is a very befitting uh, figure to be deserving of, of, of a physical presence in an institution for education. There were long discussions over whether or not we felt this was aesthetically a nice sculpture. Of course, that's an endless discussion to which I showed a few alternatives we could have had. <clears throat> but what's more important is that the statue is from an artist who also produced this particular one. And this particular statue is much larger. It's about eight meters high. And uh, his, the older brother of Confucius, of the Cambridge Confucius, if you like, this statue stood briefly for 28 days in 2011 in front of the National History Museum in Beijing, where Confucius was gazing Mao Zedong in the eyes across Tiananmen Square. When it was unveiled, it prompted a flurry of commentary at the time, and all the commentary was basically debating the rehabilitation of Chinese traditional culture and political Confucianism with a C, that is. Now, the statue was then moved after 28 days to a relatively obscure position in a courtyard sculpture garden at the back of the museum. And government officials claimed, well, that had always been the plan. The plan had always been to have it temporarily out there, <clears throat> which means that there probably was a factional struggle about having the figure of Confucius and Mao Zedong around Tiananmen Square and that obviously competition with Mao proved as yet too challenging uh, for the uh, people in charge. But what's really, really important is not so much the fate of this statue, but it is the fact that together with this particular statue, we see at the moment in China a concerted revival movement in which the Confucius figure and Confucian philosophy is being used both as a vehicle to encourage uh, people to go back to Chinese roots of civilization and to export soft power in a way to the world outside of China. And the best example of this is, or a good example of this, is the establishment of institutes known as Confucius Institutes, which you'll have. Uh, quite a few of them here in the UK. They're paired sometimes with universities. And they are institutes funded by the Chinese government that have a function. They do outreach. They teach uh, basic Chinese language. They teach or they introduce people to Chinese culture. But they're entirely funded by the Chinese government. And they are, in a sense, one could argue, in the same way as the British Council or the Alliance Francaise or the Goethe Institutes. They are, in a way, also... Um, <clears throat> tools of soft power. But this is one way in which Confucius is coming to the streets uh, of many of our cities. What's happening across China is also that you see increasingly 
a new middle class that is encouraging its children to take classes in which they study the ancient Confucian classics in the same way as that traditionally has been done for over 2,000 years until roughly in the beginning of the 20th century. Students and children dress up in traditional uniform, in the traditional sort of uh, <clears throat> dress code of Chinese literati. Here at the back, you have a newly built Confucian temple in which you have statues of the uh, Confucius figure and the Confucian disciples. And parents come and pray or pay homage to Confucius and they write the names of their children on these amulets, which they tie around the fence or near the Confucius uh, temple gate. And these are good luck charms for, well, that, that hope for children to be uh, good in their education. If your child needs to get into a good school, this is what you do. If you want to have good exam results, you do uh, invoke the power of Confucius. Another manifestation of how Confucius has become a global export is that there are now almost Oprah Winfrey style TV stars and media professors who have made it their business to talk to the masses and explain Confucian philosophy in one might argue a rather simplified way, but it all has its function of course. And the lady you see here is uh, one of the best-selling, or was one of the best-selling authors up to three years ago. She wrote a, uh, a book which, from the Chinese, translates, well, here it's, it's translated here into English as Confucius from the Heart. That is a very genuine translation of the title. It obviously has had all sorts of reviews, as you can see here in this one, uh, from John Gray's in The Guardian, who is perhaps not as, uh, not as impressed by the way in which Confucian ideas are being uh, presented in the book. Uh, there are Scholars who have referred to this particular text as Confucianism for dummies. All of that basically just to show you that really uh, the ideas of Confucius and the popularizing of Confucian philosophy are something that is an, in, or, or an interesting phenomenon to witness um, in present day China and indeed increasingly also beyond. A whole generation of adults some of whom might have missed out on education in the 60s and the 70s, the days of the Cultural Revolution, are now retooling and reschooling, even as part of their uh, job description in the company, in uh, Confucian studies classes. These are classes that are offered often at a high fee, and it is difficult to understand why it is that people uh, gather to study the Confucian classics back in a traditional way. Is this to show that one can? In other words, is this part of the cultural capital that you have as a new middle class, that you take these types of classes? Or is there more going on? Why is this Confucius figure so much on top of the agenda at present? Now, there is a connection between Confucius and Cambridge. And I can't really move on to the body of my lecture <clears throat> without pausing with this. Because in the late 18th century, there was a fellow at Clare College whose name was Nathaniel Vincent. And Vincent was admitted to Clare College, which was then known as Clare Hall, in 1653. And he became a fellow in 1660. He did, as was obviously fashion at the time, do a Doctor in Divinity degree in 1679. And from that year until Charles II's death in 1685, he was chaplain in ordinary to the king. Now, Vincent, here is his name, Nathaniel Vincent, was known for his very biting sermons in which he lambasted Charles II's courtiers, you know, Buckingham and co, for their rather libertine habits and their dubious moral conduct. Now, in one of his sermons in 1674, he tells the court of, and I quote it here, because this is <clears throat> the record we have, he talks to them, he tells the court of an old pagan empire 
on the further side of Asia, where the religion and learning which they had for above 2,000 years, and he's referring here 2,000 years since Confucius, where, it was so, where the religion and learning was to study the repair of human nature, the perfection of government, and the reasons of honor. So this is what Vincent saw in a Confucian philosophy as worthwhile noting. Now, he didn't practice what he preached because we know that he attempted to unseat the master of Clare College in all sorts of dubious ways at the time, and he never managed to become master himself. But what's really interesting is, is that this particular fellow already then gained access to Confucian philosophy. He did this through the Jesuits. He didn't read Chinese, but he used translations made by the Jesuits. And uh, he was the first English quote-unquote scholar, really, who produced a, a treatise, or who translated a treatise, a Confucian treatise known as the Great Learning, the Ta Xue, which is still the modern Chinese word for a university. A university is called a Ta Xue. So he translates that from the Latin, which you have on the left. Now, his motivation to translate Confucian philosophy was obviously to offer a corrective, to offer a moral lesson to the court and to educate Charles II, insisting that out there, far away, in this distant land which he referred to as Siam, there was an alternative model of honor. And there was an exemplary figure out there named Confucius who could teach us something, who could be relied on. Now, in the late 17th century, Vincent was not alone in turning to Confucius, because in the true spirit of the Enlightenment, famous thinkers such as Leibniz, for example, too saw in Confucius a solution for some of the problems he had with God. The Enlightenment philosophers, and I summarize this in what is obviously a, a, a rather simplified way in, in, <clears throat> in, in what is a complex argument at the time, but at, at what they were arguing is that out there in China, there seems to be a society that was not run by the punishing eye of some kind of transcendent God who was looking out over us. But actually, that out there, there was a philosophy that was a sort of a humanism, a humanism that didn't require a god or a transcendent figure that needed <coughs> to look out over uh, <coughs> what ordinary mortals did in their lives. The Chinese, it was claimed, avoided explaining the world through metaphysical categories, through very complex philosophical ideas. The Chinese, these philosophers claimed, and their rulers and their sages, they were said to be oriented towards practice. They were practical in mind. They weren't theoretically inclined. The Chinese focused on the here and now. They focused on ways in which you can improve life here, rather than worrying about what might happen in the hereafter, or in the life after the next, and so on. So in short, what happens in the 17th century is that a very imaginary Confucius offered a sort of rational, or you could, you could call it a society-oriented alternative to some of the deep-seated theological and metaphysical anxieties that were lingering on some European minds at the time. Now, I bring this example up simply to get the point across that for both these people today who are taking Confucian uh, classics lessons, as well as for the enlightened philosophers in the 17th century who are looking out at Confucius as a moral alternative you know, for, uh, <coughs> for their own philosophies, that they obviously are constructing a Confucius figure and a Confucian philosophy and in a very idealized way. In other words, they all use Confucius for a specific purpose. And the question then begs now, who is this particular person called Confucius? What do we know of him 
And why is it that over the centuries in China, but of course also for several centuries now uh, in Europe, he has, he has been molded and remolded and recycled into various persona. Let's try and see what we know about the person, his theories, and the books or the text through which his ideas have come to us. It's a very simple story. We know absolutely nothing about the historical Confucius. We know nothing about people who refer to themselves as Confucians in the days of this particular figure. And the one book that we know, or that is associated with him as being the quote-unquote Bible of Confucian philosophy, is a highly dubious text in the sense that we are almost certain that he, the text doesn't date from the time in which a historical Confucius lives. Confucius lives 2,500 years ago. But he doesn't exist to the Western world until the late 16th century, when his name is Latinized by Jesuit missionaries. So Confucius is the Latinized form of Confuze, which is Master Kong. And that means that he's born in the family of Kong, as he had been known by his followers. If you go to Chifu in the province of Shandong today, which is the birthplace of Confucius, you will discover that every single one, every single local resident claims to be, <coughs> claims to be belong to the Kong family <laughs> and claims to have ancestry that goes back to Confucius. And there is a Confucius brewery and a Confucius hotel chain and so on and so on and so on. Now, we don't have a contemporary biography of this man. And details of his life can only be uh, reconstructed from historical and legendary sources. Now, China's first great historiographer, the first person to try and record a general history of China up to the time that he lived, was known as Sima Qian, which we sometimes refer to as the, the Chinese Herodotus, if you like. He has a biography of Confucius, but obviously that is a biography that is already heavily spun. In other words, you get a narrative of the Confucius figure as a sage, but it doesn't necessarily reflect historical reality. But what sort of picture do we get of the man there that he was a relatively ordinary person, that Confucius really wasn't a religious leader who claimed any divine status. We know that he was born somewhere around 551 BC, and we know that he was born in a small little town which is located in uh, what is nowadays Shandong province, and which was then known as the little state of Lu. We know that he was a member of the lower aristocracy, and we know that his family had fallen into a pretty impoverished economic and social uh, kind of situation or status by the time he was born. We are told in that biography that he was educated by his mother and that he lost his father at the very young age and that for the largest part of his life, he remained a private person before he changed tack and devoted the rest of his days to a vocation in public service. We know he had a son who died before him and a daughter, and that is pretty much the only thing we know about the life of uh, <clears throat> Confucius. Unlike many of his contemporaries, Confucius did not take an interest in a military career. And that is quite interesting, given that this is a period in Chinese history in which warfare and aspiring to a military career was what every male uh, member of, uh, <clears throat> of, the, of the lower and middle elites would aspire to. He devotes himself, as he says, to studying the culture of the past. He obtains a following of disciples, about 3,000 of them. They all have different characters. Um, we don't know. Uh, we, there's, there's a set of about 12 or 14 we know quite a bit about. Um, 
figures are usually inflated, but we have murals here from tombs from the Han dynasty in which Confucius is depicted with some of his disciples. Here you have a late imperial depiction of one of his most loyal disciples who was named as Tzu Kung, and he was very loyal because when Confucius died, he built a hut near his tomb, and if you know that in traditional China, the requirement was that the mourning period should be three years, or should run into the third year. Our friend Tzu Kung added another three years to the mourning and basically lived in that hut for six years, so the legend tells us. Um, but anyway, so that's a reconstruction of the original hut, no doubt, but it is still out there. And Confucius lives at a time during which we cannot reasonably speak of China or imperial China or of China as one political unity. China at the time looked a little bit like what you see here on the map. China was a, an oil stain of contending statelets that were each in their own way trying to conquer the neighbors. And what happened is that this state here in the very western part on this particular map, the state of Qin, it's the state of the first emperor, eventually conquered all the other ones and unified these warring states into what becomes the Chinese Empire in 221 BC. So Confucius is not living in a unified China. He's living at a time in which you could argue he was witnessing the end of civilization because all these states were contending with each other for political power. And so what he does is he offers his services to each of these feudal lords. And all these feudal lords were hiring you know, other advisors simply charged with the task, you know, how do I build up a society that obviously is strong enough to withstand the challenges you know, from our neighbors? It's extremely interesting to note that Chinese philosophy and the heydays of Chinese philosophy, that is actually what's happening on the map here, basically between the 6th and the 3rd century BC, happens when China is basically in deep political crisis. And, you know, as I've said to some of the students this afternoon, philosophers tend to be most creative with their ideas when there are social crises happening. You know, when everything's going well, very few philosophers, or at least political philosophers, feel engaged, you know, to, to, <clears throat> to deal with the debate. But what's interesting is that the fact that Confucius and the partners he was arguing with uh, were actually operating during a very turbulent period. The result of that is that Chinese philosophy, from its beginning, was very much oriented on political issues and on social issues. The question was not what would happen to us in the afterlife. The question is simply, how does a ruler organize society in the best way? And what is your role as an individual, as part of this larger unit, called uh, society. Let's move on briefly to the book or the text associated with the figure of Confucius, known in English translation as the Confucian. Analects, you know, which is, uh, which you see here in various, in various incarnations uh, in front of you. Again, this is a text, I mean, if you translate the Chinese title of the text, it would read something as selected sayings or excerpts from uh, <coughs> the sayings of Confucius. They are not dated to the lifetime of Confucius. They were probably written, to get, written down over the four centuries following his life by disciples. It's a text which is very much written in a dialogue form in which a disciple asks a question to Confucius, who's always referred to as the master, and the master then replies. So it's the master-disciple dialogue through which his ideas uh, have come forward. So these are simply just some details of the text in question. We need not necessarily uh, dwell on this for too long, other than that one of the reasons that it is problematic for scholars to get there uh, <coughs> or, or, or to, to talk with certainty about whether or not a text from ancient China uh, <coughs> is is, is representative of 
and what might have been out there at the time it has to do with the physical way in which texts were written down in ancient China. And here you have an example of what a text in China at the time of Confucius would have looked like. It would not have been written on paper, of course, which wasn't invented yet. It would have been written on bamboo, on bamboo slips. And these bamboo slips, and I've shown this this afternoon to some of the students, but I'll show it again here. These bamboo slips were then tied together with, you know, here with little <coughs> cords and threads here, usually in three registers. And then you roll up the strips, and then you have a chapter of a book. Right. So a roll of bamboo slips, essentially, is a chapter of a book. The real size of these slips at the time would have been something like this. This is a, these are the opening lines of China's most famous military classic, Sun Tzu's Art of Warfare, written in the size in which the original would have been transmitted on two sample bamboo slips. So keep that in mind because, of course, what happens, and here you have some examples, when people were cutting the bamboo slips on which the scribes were going to write ideas down, and when these were tied together and then put in a library, this would be a bookshelf in the time of Confucius. What happens, of course, is that over time, when these texts are, end up in tombs, or when they are transporting from one place to another, the uh, <coughs> obviously, the threads that keep them together disintegrate, and all these bamboo slips fall apart. And of course, that means you need to reconstruct the original text. And some of these, of course, have not been transmitted, and some of these rolls might have dropped off the cart, so to speak, when they were being transported from place A to B. And so, when we talk about a book or a text of ancient China, we should really not think in terms of what we think today of as a book. In other words, a text that starts from the first page and ends up in the last page. It's a, it's <clears throat> there are lots of problems and lots of defects in the books. These are some of the scribes' tools. I mean, if you made a mistake, you know, you didn't use whatever your typex or something, you could rub off the characters. And this is then what a text would look like. This is how we would find it now in tombs. So you can imagine when you find a text as a sort of a, a heap of. Uh, <clears throat> wet, almost rotten bamboo slips clipped together, it is a bit of a job by paleographers to reconstruct this. And this is uh, well, a famous actor, a famous Hong Kong actor, who was playing the role of Confucius in a, I was going to say a blockbuster, but it wasn't quite a blockbuster movie about Confucius some years ago. And I like this shot because here is Confucius sitting in his library. and. Watch the color code on his books. You know, I don't know how he divides. Well, you know, <clears throat> what's geography, what's travel, what's cookery, and so on. But anyway, so keep in mind that when we talk about texts and books at the time, you know, this is something uh, <clears throat> that is not the same as you know what we imagine texts and books to be today. The only way really to have a stable text in the Chinese character script, the only way to ensure that a certain version of a text gets transmitted is obviously to invest energy and carve it into a rock or a stone. And that is what eventually happened. With all the Confucian classics, they were carved in stone. And then, of course, you could make rubbings off the stone by putting rice paper on it in later times and then making a negative imprint. And that's how you could copy texts and circulate them in the pre-printing uh, area. Now, what we read then, when we read the Confucian Analects, we are reading a text of authorship of which is highly in doubt. And you could argue that it's possible to read the ideas of Confucius as they appear in the Analects without really wondering who the historical Confucius was, and without, uh, <clears throat> without worrying too much about whether the ideas can be linked to specific events at the time. And I think that's probably the best way to look at the philosophy of Confucius. What I'd like to do is take you through a few of the core ideas of Confucius, and then as we go through them, link them 
to ways in which they have been translated through the ages and in the contemporary world. And I hope to show, perhaps not necessarily convince you, that some of these ideas are extremely interesting and offer extremely interesting potential if they are being applied to the modern world and to what we expect society and relationships between individuals and between countries uh, to consist of. I'm going to talk a little bit about teaching and learning, which is very appropriate in the settings here, because Confucius, after all, is the master of education. And he was referred to as uh, <coughs> the patron of all teachers. I shall say a little bit about the idea that the past is something that should inspire the present and that people who make decisions today always ought to test their ideas against what happened in the past. I'm going to say a little bit about his this-worldliness, the idea that he doesn't really talk, a little, uh, talk too much about the spirit world. Most importantly, we're going to say a little bit then about the ideal of the gentleman, the ideal Confucian person. What should an ideal Confucian person be like? How should he behave? And if you were somebody in charge of society, either at his day or perhaps even today, uh, what are the sort of characteristics that a Confucian ruler should cultivate? And then finally, we say a little bit about government itself. Now, he was a teacher, and I suppose he has been known in Chinese civilization as the person whose ideas in the form of the Chinese classics had to be studied by every single person who had ambitions to become a civil servant. The civil service exams in imperial China were conducted usually in the capital, and the system to, or <clears throat> the way in which you became a, per, a person of importance in traditional China was by becoming a civil servant. And the closer you got to the capital, it's a bit like the closer you get to Whitehall, the more important the position, and so on and so on. So we have a great deal of documentation about how Confucian ideas had to be studied as part of an exam culture. This is a reconstruction of what an examination hall you know, in Ming periods would have, would have been like. I don't know how you guys do your exams here in college, but I hope you get a bit more leg room than examination candidates got in traditional China. Right. This is another drawing of this. <clears throat> I really love this piece of evidence. Um, obviously not to be followed. This is a shirt that an examination candidate uh, would have worn, but this one wasn't one who was taking his job very seriously because he's obviously copied bits of the Confucian classics on the shirt, and he wanted to obviously cheat during the exam. So here we have a representation, actually, of the stress that people would have been under to pass the civil service exams. Uh, I love this one. This is a candidate who is obviously not interested in doing his exam. I mean, you would be locked in for days on end to take the exam. And he's fallen asleep, or what does it say? He's, he's drank too much. And look what happened then here in the text balloon, or in the clouds, or in his dream. His ancestor appears and taps him on the shoulder and says, well, hello, son, you're not doing this exam for you. You're doing it for the family. You're doing it actually for the, for the extended clan. And this is the duty. I mean, even if you don't believe in what you're doing, you have to do it for the honor of the family because obviously every male uh, person who is educated should aspire to become a civil servant. So education, 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 no names mentioned, but that would really have been the philosophy of Confucius at the time. He's known as the first and supreme teacher, and today, still, on September the 28th, he is celebrated, as, or September the 28th, actually, it's still Teacher's Day. Right? It's uh, <clears throat> the national day for teachers. You see, he's being, I suppose, during graduation ceremonies now in schools in certain parts of China, you find students dressing up in the same uniforms as traditional examination candidates would have had to celebrate you know, their graduation. Look how wonderful they all look. Now, teaching and learning, but what sort of teaching and what sort of learning does Confucius stand for? The first thing to say is that Confucius was somebody who believed that everybody, regardless of their social background, was able to be educated. So in that sense, 
He had the view that you could cultivate somebody's character regardless of uh, the baggage or the advantages that you've had from the past. He states that he doesn't mind taking remuneration for teaching, but he would adapt his fee according to what the student was able to, uh, <coughs> was able to, to, to pay. He has a rather optimistic view uh, about human nature in the sense that he thinks that human nature, regardless of individual circumstances, can be, you know, can be cultivated. And that every single person can be turned into a gentleman or a Confucian moral exemplar. You could argue that he's also the first advocate of lifelong learning. You know, here you have a quote. These are all quotes from the Analects to illustrate the idea. Right At 15, my heart was set upon learning. This is what the majority of people here present in, in, in <coughs> tonight you know, should, should have on their mind. At 30, I had become established. At 40, I was no longer perplexed. At 50, I knew the mandate of heaven, which is a Chinese way of saying I knew what life was all about. At 60, I obeyed. Well, that's late for some, perhaps. <laughs> and at 70, I could follow my heart's desires. So that what he's trying to say is, well, life is lifelong learning. And basically, at every stage in your career, you can do this. But what is really interesting is that what he understands by learning, by studying, the opening lines of the Confucian Analects start with a line that says, is it not delightful to study and then at appropriate times practice, in other words, put into practice what you have learned? And for those amongst you who are interested in the Chinese language, the modern Chinese word for studying consists of two characters, xue, xi. They're two different words, if you like. And these are the two different characters you have in the opening lines of the Confucian Analects. And the first character, xue, means something like studying. But the second component in that word, xi, to put it into practice, is very, very important. The idea is here that theoretical knowledge, learning something without there somehow being a practical application to these ideas is not necessarily the thing you should invest a time in. So the idea is that the good student is somebody who learns from his master, tries to emulate his master, but tries to put into practice what he preaches. Practically orientated learning. He is very much aware that studying is a very tough job. And that actually it takes real courage to do it and to see it through. And for those amongst you who go to university or move on after <coughs> your experience here, Confucius would recognize that this is you know, a difficult but very challenging journey. Because at one point in the Analects he says, it is not easy to find a man who can study for three years without thinking about earning a salary. So he is very realistic you know, that people come into learning for some uh, practical ideas, <coughs> some practical purposes. Now, here we have Lincoln. And I pulled this one up from one of his first political announcements. And what he is essentially saying is education, education, education. And what I would like to encourage is a universal application, universal opportunity for learning, 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 learning. For my part, I desire to see the time when education, and by its means morality, sobriety, enterprise, and industry, I mean, these are words that almost echo the three or four terms that are uh, Nathaniel Vincent in his, in his statement in the beginning I was talking about. And obviously, uh, <clears throat> this was an aspiration of Lincoln, quite clearly. Now, what would learning then mean, and where do you get your inspiration? As you see, some shots here of uh, festivals and ritual, uh, I suppose, commemorations of the Confucius figure that are still happening in, 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 in China uh, today, and actually that are being revived. Confucius says, I know nothing new. I don't invent anything. Everything that I know 
has already said, been said in the past. For Confucius, the ideal world was the world of the Zhou period. It was an idealized period centuries before he lived. And it's interesting, he looked at the past as the time in which society was harmonious. And that what you should do is, when you are facing a crisis, you should try and restore balance so that everything reverts back to an age during which everything was, you know, was, was <clears throat> so to speak, uh, functioning very well. It's a very interesting idea that you assume that you're not looking at a utopia, you're not looking at the future being the time in which society will be in perfect harmony, in which the harmonious society will be created, but essentially that you presume that in the past there was a stage during your history where everything was well, and that in essence, politicians are charged with restoring a balance in society that was originally there already, rather than coming up with creative new ideas of forging a society into a shape that has never been seen before in the past. So he says, I transmit, I don't uh, <coughs> create. So you could call him in many ways a conservative, but then conservative in the sense of the word that actually is trying to, uh, to perpetuate an ideal of society that was already there in the past. Now, this idea that you need the past to justify the present is a philosophy, you could even say it's, you know, it's, it's a dogma that runs through every political age throughout Chinese civilization into the 21st century, into the day of today in China. Every significant leader in China, be they emperors, be they members of the Communist Party, can only justify their legitimacy by saying, well, look, what I'm doing is I'm using ideas by somebody in the past, not your immediate predecessors, because your immediate predecessors are always the bad ones, right? Governments always condemn previous governments, but then go back three or four governments in the past and say, well, you look, in those days, people had ideas. You have to do that in China, too. Whether you think the first emperor was great or whether you think another famous figure was great, you need to be able to... <clears throat> To, to gain authority by anchoring your own position in history against what went before you. History books today in China will use that as a slogan. Children, why do you need to learn history? Because without, needing, without learning the past, you can't understand the present. Right? And you can use that ideologically in all sorts of ways, of course, but it's, 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 a, it's an idea that goes back a long, long time. This worldliness for Confucius and his contemporaries, worrying about the spirits is not something you should be doing. In essence, what you do is you manage them, you appease them, and you make sure that they don't disturb you. The spirit world in the days of Confucius, and in many ways actually in religion in China today, is an entirely different type of spirit world as the one you would see in Judeo-Christian societies. The main spirits in Chinese society would be ancestral spirits. It's your father, your mother, your grandmother, your grandfather, your ancestors. So essentially, the umbilical cord that you have with your parents continues when, you're at, when, when your parents and your grandparents die off. So the spirit world is very much linked to the lineage, to your family. And you have to make sure you keep them, uh, you keep them at peace. Don't upset your ancestors. And you do that by offering sacrifices. And you do that, obviously, by... Uh, <clears throat> By, by appeasing them. Now here is then the ideal of what the Confucian self-accomplished exemplary person should be. And these are the values that he should hold high. Some of you might have seen a word of Chinese. First one on the top there. Benevolence. It's an awful English word, but that's the only way we can translate what is actually a Chinese character that consists of two parts. On the right side, you see there are two lines, which is the number two. Well, it's very simple. You have one line is number one, two lines is number two, three lines is number three in Chinese. It's that easy. But here, 
it's number two and on the left side of that character. Now I'm just wondering whether I have a little... Anyway, on the left side of that character, you have the element for human being. So that character which I translate here as benevolence essentially means human beings consist of two. And that's a very interesting idea. For Confucius, you can't speak of the individual. For Confucius, the person is somebody who is a plural. In other words, we all have various roles in society. And who you are is not something that you can define unless you define it against your relationships with other people. So we are not individuals. We are part of a network of people. And it is essential that the relationships between people are very clearly defined. And we'll see a little bit about that in a minute. Secondly, ritual propriety is sort of a very stiff translation of it's, being, it's politeness. I mean, the good person is somebody who follows a number of rules, you know, who knows how to walk, how to talk, who knows uh, how to perform ceremonies, who knows how to eat, how to dine properly. Um, it's basically etiquette as well as sort of good manners. A sense of righteousness. And then here, very importantly, and that's a core confusion value, filial piety, another very stiff English translation for the Chinese character, which is known as xiao. And filial piety essentially means utter and total devotion to your seniors, to your parents, to your grandparents, to anybody who is to the elderly. And that utter devotion is not simply moral support. In other words, we all like our grandmother, our grandfather, but it also means physical and financial support. And the idea is you are put in the world by your parents, right? It's a cycle. At one point, it is your duty to look after your parents in the same way as your parents have looked after you. It's a very uh, interesting concept, of course, because it means that the charge, the balance of social security lies with the family, it doesn't lie with the state. There is no state, there is no government that is going to look after you. So theoretically speaking, that would mean that uh, <coughs> your family uh, provides, and in return for that, you provide for the family. The most important relationships for Confucius then are those between a ruler and a subject, a father and a son, brothers, a husband and a wife, and a friend and a friend. And the way now to make sure that that network of people works properly is to ensure that every one of us knows exactly in what role we're cast in any point in our lives. Let rulers be rulers, ministers be ministers, fathers be fathers, and sons be sons. Essentially what Confucius is saying, we're all role-playing constantly. All of us are role-playing, right? I'm a father, but I'm also a son, right? I might be the teacher here. You might be the disciple here. You know, when I go home tonight and I talk to my wife, if I stand up to my wife and I teach to her, it's not going to work because I would be adopting the wrong role play, right? So all of you have multiple social roles, right? You might be the mayor. You might be... Uh, <clears throat> you, 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 might, you might be... Uh, a servant, you might be a, a disciple, you might be... And these roles are changing all the time. Right? And now the knack, the most important thing for Confucius or for Confucian philosophy is to know where your role in society is and to stick to that one and to not fall out of your role, so to speak. So in essence, what he's saying was, well, hierarchy is a good thing. And so if you've got a ruler, you need to respect the ruler because he is a ruler. And it is your duty then, as a, as a minister or as a servant, you know, to respect uh, the ruler. In the same way as when you are a son, you should behave like a son towards your father. Whether you're four years of age or whether you're 45 years of age, that doesn't make a difference. So the person is defined by a set of social roles rather than an individual with its own rights, privileges, aspirations, and so on. Importantly, if you see how this works in terms of ideas, for example, that have to do with justice, it's very interesting. I'm giving you a quote here, and this is the opening case which you have in probably the first chapter of many books in law schools across 
across China. Here is a conversation in which a specific lord, Confucius, was advising, he says, well, you know, in my town, right, in my precinct, there's a guy who's really, he's very upright. He's, there's a perfect, a perfect person in my town. When his father steals a sheep, the guy gives evidence against his father. Right? Now, Confucius then says, well, you know, where I live, it's slightly different. In my town, he says, fathers cover up for their sons, and sons cover up for their fathers, and that is justice. So you see what's happening here. Confucius says, the most important guideline to follow is the obligation of you to respect the harmony within the family. And even if that means covering up misdemeanors by somebody in your family against the wider remit of the law or of society at large, then that is in certain circumstances justified. So the message this sends out, I feel, if we as individuals are part of a social network, then our families are units that are the first and most important ones. And a society essentially is built up of building blocks that are essentially families. Right. The modern Chinese word for a country still today is guo jia. Guo is a country, and jia, you know, which writes, it's a roof with a pig underneath, is a family. So in essence, a state, a society, consists of a bunch of families together. And of course, the interests of the family, of the clan, they can be, they can in a sense be in tension with the interest of the public good. And so the history of China, in a way, you know, can sometimes be described as a history of a constant tension between interests of families, clans, lineages, and the state. So it's a different orientation towards the obligations of the state versus those of families. Now I'm coming to my international relations part of Confucius philosophy. Somewhere in the Analyx, he says, well, the E and the T barbarians, and this is a, again, a very stiff translation because there is no word for barbarian. It's the E and the T. These are two specific tribes. He says, these guys, without their rulers, are not as viable as the various Chinese states without them. In other words, even if we in the central Chinese states had no rulers, we would still be more civilized than the people that surround us. Now, this is a quote that is rarely being picked up of the Confucian Analects, but it is a very essential one because it is one that does underline that in the Confucian view of the world, centrality is something that is very important. The word China today, or Zhongguo, simply means the central states. It means, in a, in a sense, the heart of the world. In the time of Confucius, this is, you know, this is, this is a physical, a geographical map of China. And so China proper would be somewhere here. The heart of civilization would be viewed here in the basin of the Yellow River. And then the view of the world is one that the further you go away from the heart of civilization, the more barbarian it gets. And the further you go away from the Chinese heartland, the more you can identify human beings sometimes with animals or with people who behave differently. So there is an embedded sense of a kind of cultural superiority in some of these ideas. You may say, well, it's very odd that the Chinese you know, should see themselves as the center of the world and the world around them as peripheral uh, in essence, all empires do that, right? If you buy a map of the world in China, China will be on the center of the map. If you buy a map here in London, you know, like you'll have Great Britain in the middle of the map. And if you buy one in Paris, you know, or in, in, the, in the United States of America, you'll have probably the United States of America in the center of, of the map. So this is, this is <clears throat> not unusual. But what it has impacted on is that in its dealings with the world outside, China has always operated on the assumption that the world outside should come to the cultural heartland and that the cultural heartland shouldn't go out to the periphery and start to trade or make its case in uh, the world beyond China. You know, I, I, if you look for an image, actually, of a view on power, I thought these ones would work in a way. On the right, anybody recognize the gentleman on the right here? 
right? Here's, here's Napoleon on his horse. This is the Kangxi Emperor, late 17th century, one of the longest ruling uh, emperors. Now, if you look at the representation of an emperor in traditional China, you'll never have him sitting on a horse showing off his muscles, about to conquer something. A Chinese ruler sits very silently, immobile, and he radiates a kind of power that is hidden, right? He sits there, and it is basically his inarticulate movements or his silence, you know, that gives him an aura of power. Chinese rulers live behind big walls, high walls. They're not visible. They don't go out on processions, and you don't, certainly don't find <coughs> a Chinese ruler standing here like Louis XIV. No, a Chinese ruler is like a Chinese landscape. He's hidden, high away. And to be hidden is to be powerful because you're unpredictable and nobody knows where the source of authority comes from. And Chinese rulers throughout the ages have done so, and of course today still the Chinese government lives in a walled compound and you know whatever goes on in there. And the Japanese emperor, by the way, as well. So the idea that being hidden and having the world around you come and pay homage to you is <clears throat> part of this a particular kind of philosophy. Traditionally, then, in China, the expectation was that if you wanted to have foreign relationships with China, you did this not through trading, but you did this through what was known the tribute system. You expected foreign delegations to offer tribute to the Chinese court, usually symbolical gifts. You were given an audience, and you were given, obviously, <coughs> returns by the Chinese emperor, but it was a very symbolical and ritual act. Foreign relationships in China were dealt with by what was known as the, the Ministry of Ritual, of Rites. So it was a, it was, it was a ritual kind of uh, submission, and of course the most uh, symbolical, physical show of submission in international relations is you know, the famous you know, the kowtow, right, is when you, when you bend down and you show your submission to the Chinese emperor. And when Lord McCartney, of course, in 1793, as the British envoy, didn't quite think that that was the right way to do it. And when he stood up, whereas he would have <coughs> had to go on his, on his knees, that caused, that caused a bit of an incident, you know, to put it mildly. Today, this has changed. If you look at pictures, of course, of Chinese leaders, you know, it is quite important uh, to note that kind of being on the same level with your partner it seems, to be, seems to be part in the way in which leaders represent themselves. Um, you see also that in diplomatic missions, the way the tables are arranged, the way seating plans are arranged, these are no longer, of course, relationships of, of submission. And of course, we move from a situation now, of course, in, in international relations where it is a British prime minister or an American president, you know, who, you know, who shows the way to a Chinese president. <coughs> um, in many ways, you know, we have, a, we have a reverse situation here. But in essence, the idea that the world outside China comes to China and that China goes to the world outside its own borders, not necessarily politically, but only through some trade, through trade and through goods and so on, that is deeply embedded you know, in the way in which China views relationships with the outside world today. China isn't conquering. China is claiming still certain parts to be, you know, to be, or certain bits of geography to be part of China. But there has never been an offensive type of war fought by the Chinese on another continent, so to speak. There is never, there have been expeditions since the 17th century, and some of them have reached the east coast of Africa, and Mombasa and the giraffes brought back to the Chinese court. But these things were not done. Uh, out of a, an obsession of, of, of physical occupation or physical resonance. It is all about what initially was symbolical power and what that translates to today is in you know, relationships uh, <clears throat> that gave you access to you know, particular resources. So the Chinese ruler, and whether it's an emperor or whether it's actually the leader of the Communist Party, is still somebody who is seen as someone who is maintaining some kind of social harmony and acts on behalf of his subject. And for Confucius, this was formulated in this strange idea that actually common people can be made to follow a path, but not to understand it. You know, this is a little bit of a, a tricky idea. The idea that your rulers are by definition enlightened. Now, that's problematic, of course, if you've got the wrong ones. And there are ideas, also in Confucian philosophy, that say, well, when your ruler loses his credit, the people somehow should unseat him. 
And so for Confucius, and in the Confucian view of politics, a ruler is invested with what is called the mandate of heaven. And you can, com you can compare the mandate of heaven with a credit card, right? It's charged, right? And you have to make sure you manage your budget properly. And as soon as you're running out of credit, somebody else can come in place and, and take over. And in essence, you know, the struggles, the faction struggles within the Communist Party, I mean, they are very much almost uh, repetitions of this pattern. There is a dynastic cycle. Ultimately, everything uh, will revert. <coughs> Uh, back to where it started. So harmony, and this is really where I uh, <coughs> would like to, uh, I suppose, pause before I end. Harmony is the ultimate ideal in Confucian philosophy, but the, by harmony you have to understand not some kind, of, some kind of 1960s romanticized idea of we all get on with each other. No, harmony means everybody knows their role in society and does exactly what's expected of them. Now, in 2008, when the Chinese Olympics were conducted, there was a massive opening ceremony. And of course, opening ceremonies are the best ways in which you can see how societies view their own heritage. And this was a fantastic show. It lasted for hours. And the final scene of the opening ceremony was this one. Actors dressed up as, guess who, Confucius, holding in their hands, guess what? bamboo copies of the Confucian Analects, doing a dance, beautifully choreographed, and in the end, forming the character He, which means a blend, harmony. So that was really the message they were trying to send out uh, through that particular ceremony. Now, interestingly, and for those amongst you who do like Chinese food, this character, he, harmony, also means to mix ingredients in a harmonious manner. So you can actually make the comparison that the good ruler does to his people what the good cook does the, to the ingredients. In other words, you make sure no flavor stands out in any, you know, it's not too sour, it's not too sweet. Right? It's not too sharp, not too much spice in it, not too bland. So the, the, the vocabulary of cooking and the vocabulary of politics are remarkably close in the Chinese context. Good, so briefly, and I'll skip over this, these are just some ideas that Confucius has about money making and some more cultural extract that he, do, he was a man and he did have his own feelings because at one point he said, well, I've yet to meet a man who is as fond of virtue, by which he meant Confucian values, as he is of beauty and women, right? And then he also says at one point that he, uh, <clears throat> he didn't shy away from a drink, Confucius was the perfect drinker, but by that you shouldn't understand him as being somebody who had a problem you know, with, <clears throat> with alcohol, but it means that he was, he was one of those people who could go through a whole day of ritual and ritual drinking without being overcome by drink. That was uh, what he meant by saying that I can, I can hold my wine. So what happens over the centuries, of course, Confucius then gets interpreted and reinterpreted uh, <clears throat> over and over again. In the late 19th century, a Scottish Presbyterian priest by the name of James Legg then translates the Confucian classics into English, arguably the most influential translation of the classics in the Western world. And today, when you walk through the streets of Beijing, you will see little stalls like this in which you get free copies of the Confucian classics distributed to you in a movement which is known as New Confucianism. That is, there are a group of people now, and some of them even belong to the Communist Party. Some of these are intellectuals. Some of these are business people who do believe that in that sort of, uh, in, in, in that, in, in that uh, world of ideas, there are some core values that are absolutely essential for China's modernization. Harmony, you know, virtue, and the idea that you look at you know, society as a network, as a web of relationships. You have them in China, you also have them outside China. There are people in Boston who call themselves the Boston Confusions. And so we are yet too early to assess what this whole process of a Confusion revival in China means today. But we now have reached a stage in which children read it through uh, you know, through, through manga or cartoon forms. And it is 
undoubtedly the case that in the next two or three decades, we were going to have to need to keep an eye on the ways in which these kind of philosophies are being translated and adapted you know, for <clears throat> a new narrative on what China should look internally and how it should behave um, to the world outside. There are journalists or people whom in my trade are sometimes referred to as China watchers who make it their profession to predict where China will be in 10 years time, in 20 years time, in 100 years time. When I started studying Chinese, that was the first question you got. Where do you think China is going to be in 20 years time? Well, I don't think anybody knows. But what we do know and what we do, I think, need to wake up to is in order to understand where it wants to be, it is high time that we delve into that genetic material that makes up you know, the, sort of the world of thought that this society has been uh, <clears throat> based on over 2,000 years. In essence, I don't see necessarily that much of a difference in the way <clears throat> be between the way in which the Chinese government or the Communist Party packages ideas about authority and the way that was done in Imperial China in the 19th century or indeed the way that was done by the first emperor in the third century BC. <clears throat> so in many ways, these are modern ideas. And so I'll leave you with a slide of Confucius having a good look at the crest of this wonderful college. Thank you very much for your attention. gentlemen and our esteemed guests. I would like to thank Professor Roel Sturks for his fascinating lecture on the world according to Confucius. It was very interesting learning of his career choice and life story along with many insightful answers to questions asked in the chapel this afternoon. I'm sure all in attendance feel equally as enlightened and intrigued by the world of social history so eloquently presented to us tonight. The lecture was eye-opening to a large and fast-growing part of the world that is developing quicker than our understanding so far. I was particularly interested to learn about the idea that politicians, um, rather than create new ideas to, uh, they, they return to the original harmony and restore the peace that has been before. And as a college, we have particularly strong international links and to learn so much more of a country we consider ourselves close to, both through students and scholastic ties, is an opportunity far too rare, but immensely appreciated. On behalf of Wyndham College, I would like to extend a thanks to Professor Sturks for giving up his time this evening to be with us, for sharing his wisdom, and for introducing us to this new area of such rich culture that I'm sure many of us will enjoy exploring further. It was, it was great. Thank you. Did it make sense? Oh, it was fantastic. Thanks. Thanks.